It's all yours. Good evening. Good evening, world. We have an extraordinary group of people from vast distances. We've heard from Poland and from New Zealand and from Iran and from Northern England and my brother in England and people from all over. It's extraordinary. North Carolina, Brazil, Zurich, and where it's midnight in the middle of the night. People gathered together, and of course, many people gathered together from all over this country, and particularly from the area of the Boston Philharmonic Reach, because this is an event sourced by the Boston Philharmonic, of which I have been the conductor for 41 years, and the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, which would be going into its eighth year. And it's from this base that we are speaking i am speaking to you today when i say we i don't mean we i mean i because i'm alone i'm alone in my music room i wish i could show you all the beautiful things in my music room and also in the garden which is exquisite but we're here just sitting together uh, at my piano and it's so interesting what a different world we live in we're in the midst of a terrible world crisis with suffering and fear and anguish on a level that hasn't been seen since the wars, the, na the national wars. And yet we're connected. We're connected in a very strange way. I mean, these amazing implements like Zoom and, and enable us to be connected. Imagine if these machines didn't work and we were really alone. I've been sitting in my house now for two and a half months not going out except into the garden and but i haven't felt isolated at all in fact in a way i felt more connected than i ever have because during the regular life that i lead and most of us lead i'm so busy and so frantic going from one thing to another and the next rehearsal and the fundraising and the organization and the music and the, and it's so much that i don't pay attention to what's going on beyond. And as a result of this extraordinary development, I've woken up to some connections and relationships that I had actually no idea about. I'll tell you a story which happened today. My brother sent me a very precious document this morning, which is the diary that my father wrote uh, from the age of 14. He turned 14 on June the 8th, 2012 and he described the first few days of his 14th year and he just got, he got a new teacher he was very excited about the new teacher who was also the teacher of Artur Nikish the great conductor and he was very excited he practiced from morning to night and morning to night every day and then he was reading he was doing all these things and then he suddenly remembered he must have been on the 10th of June that it was Richard Strauss's birthday the next day. And so he said, oh, goodness, I have to write to him for his birthday. <laughs> and he wrote and he included in the birthday letter that he expected a reply. <laughs> and then he went about his business. And the next day, two days later, he was uh, going for tennis, but it was raining. And so he went uh, to rowing instead. And then they went to dancing. And then he came home at 12.45 in the evening. And there was a letter from Richard Strauss thanking him for his letter. And one just has to pause for a moment and think, what kind of a world was that? He wasn't sure whether he was in Berlin, which is where my father was, whether he was in Berlin or whether he was in Munich, but he wrote him anyway and expected a reply. <laughs> now, we don't live that way now, but we are connected in a very strange and wonderful way. I have no idea who's come into my living room, but you have actually come into my living room. It's as if you're sitting beside me here on the chair and I'm sitting at the piano and we're talking with each other. Now, I suspect since everybody's home, there may be some children around. And I've had a request to play the Hippopotamus song. Hippopotamus song was something I wrote was about 18 years old with a friend. And we had a lot of fun doing it, uh, giggling madly at the while. And this is the Hippopotamus song, which I get to sing for the children. But the adults will enjoy it too. I had a hip 
hippopotamus. I kept him in a shed. I fed him upon vitamins and vegetable bread. I made him my companion on my many country walks. And I had his portrait done by a celebrity in chalks. And if he was afflicted by depression or the dumps, such as hippopotamusals or the hippopotamumps, I wouldn't know a particle of peace till it was plain. He was hippopotamasticating properly again. I had a hippopotamus, I kept him as a friend, but beautiful relationships are bound to have an end. Life takes away our joys from us and robs us of our blisses. My hippopotamus turned out a hippopotamusimus. My landlady regarded her with jaundice in her eye. She didn't want a colony of hippopotami. So she borrowed a machine gun from her soldier nephew, Percy. And she showed my hippopotamus. No hippopotamus The house now lacks the glamour which the chummy creature gave. The garage where I kept her is silent as a grave. No longer she displays among the motor tires and spanners her hippopotamastery of hippopotamana. I had a hippopotamus, but nothing on this earth is lasting in its values or constant in its worth. No joy that life can give me now will be enough to smother my sorrow for what might have been a hippopotamus. I suspect that most people listening to that for the moment that he was going on, had their mood transformed, whatever mood they were in. Because the humor of the words and the delightful story and the music make for a delightful experience that has a way of infiltrating into our brain, into our heart, into our molecules in such a way that whatever mood we're in, it can affect it. Now, it's a well-known fact that music can do that and we need we need some help in this situation because we are all in one to one degree or another in a state of monumental fear and upset on an hourly basis and so we need help and we need help from many sources and one of the sources that we can turn to is simply being focused on and disciplined about the words that come out of our mouth. We have a choice, and there's a famous story which I've told many times and I never get tired of telling it because it's always equally amusing. Here's the story of the two shoe salesmen go to Africa and they decide they want to see if they can sell shoes. This is in the 1900s. They come from Manchester in England. And they look around and one of them sends a telegram back to Manchester saying, situation hopeless, stop, they don't wear shoes. The other one looks around and says, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. <laughs> now, both of them are looking at the same thing. So it isn't the circumstance that's important. It's what we say about it that's important. And that's extremely important discovery which a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old can make just as well as an adult which is that we have a choice at the moment before we speak we have a choice either to speak in the downward spiral as we call it of fear and anxiety pressure competition and all that stuff or we can talk in possibility radiating possibilities we call it with the sun going out in all directions and we have that choice at every moment of every day of our lives and most of all we have a choice now because carelessness with what we say and how we act can have dire circumstances on vast numbers of people so we have to be extremely careful and that discipline is crucial for us and i 
urge us all as teachers and as leaders and as parents and as all the various functions we have to be mindful and disciplined about how we speak and how we say what we have to say. But also the decisions we make are very crucial. It's very easy to confuse this with happy talk, with positive thinking. Isn't everything great? No, everything is not great. Anybody who thinks everything is great right now is just not paying attention. And in fact, it's very misleading and very disturbing if people pretend that things are fine. They're not fine. But that doesn't mean we're locked down. We are confined, but that's something else. And I tell with pleasure a story of my the same father who, who wrote that he had to write a letter to Strauss. I saw that this morning. It's absolutely hilarious. When he found himself, as many people did in the war, in an internment camp in the Isle of Man, the British took all these refugees, Jewish refugees who were fleeing from Nazism and put them in these internment camps, thinking out of fear that they would somehow take over or be a risk, which was, was nonsense. But anyway, there they were, and they were all suffering terribly. My father amongst them. His mother died in the camps and several other members of the family. He lost everything and, and started a life and then interned. And he was surrounded with 2,000 men, all in the similar situation, all of them having experienced terrible loss and living under fear, almost unimaginable fear. He looked around and he said, oh, there are a lot of intelligent people here. How about if we had a university? And so he started a university with some friends and they got together and they made groups and they had 46 classes going every week. No books, no paper, no pencil, no chalk, no chalkboard, nothing. Just people talking to each other. That is possibility. And out of this catastrophe, there have become a vast number of new possibilities, new universities, if you like. I uh, had the most extraordinary experience of connecting up with 274 conductors around the world in 22 countries. And we announced that there was going to be a conducting class just like this, just a screen and 274 conductors connected and said registered. They said they want to be part of it. And many of them may be listening now from many, many different parts of the world. New people who I had no reason that I would ever meet and connect with. And we've been in contact with email and, you know, it's just, it's amazing. I've been so busy, <laughs> busier than ever. And that's very, very exciting that you can be alone trapped as it were confined but not locked down the heart the brain the mind is creating and inventing and connecting and that's the world of possibility the world of connection the world of inclusion the world of inquiry curiosity love being available that's the world of possibility and that's what i've invited you all into my room to experience through music because it turns out of all the languages that have been developed, music is probably the most powerful for connecting people and breaking down the barriers of fear and of tension and of closeness that we all feel we want to break out of. Music is irresistible. And how that works is what I want to explore with you today. We saw a little bit of it with the funny song of the hippopotamus, but I want to go in a different direction. Imagine that you were feeling rather down and depressed and lonely, and suddenly you heard this. <laughs> You 
you wouldn't be depressed. Try, try, try and be depressed while that music is going on around you. And imagine with an orchestra and the tremendous sound and the energy and the excitement and the people. That's what, of course, we musicians do. We create that. Nobody can resist that. And that's Beethoven in the darkest time. He was deaf. He couldn't hear it. And he was in lonely. He was depressed. He was in a terrible place. But he still managed to find that pathway to triumph, always, always with Beethoven. Now, imagine, on the other hand, you lost somebody. A dear friend today reported his mother died. So if we think... Mm -hmm. an amen right so now if you look at that score you look at that Beethoven score and you say well what's going on there what are the where is my where is the score I just had it here a moment ago uh, so, oh, here, here we are. is this just let's look at that we know what the circumstances are it's a funeral it's a funeral of a great man. It's a funeral of Napoleon or a great hero. And the first sound boom, 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 on the lowest str string of the, of the violin. You can't go any lower. Very soft. Boom, 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 boom. That represents the inertia you feel when you can't move. Boom, boom. That's the drum. Defiance. Despair. Whenever you want to despair. That Jewish style. Like in Fiddler on the Roof. You have that all. Now this pathos. Now. Protest. are emotions that belong in the realm of the funeral march loss despair anguish all the emotions so we understand how that music works and how it goes to our heart and when we hear that music if it's convincingly played and played as a funeral march in two um, bo -bo, two um, bo -bo, bo -bi, bo -bi. Everybody can respond to that. That's a universal language that I always say half jokingly, but only half joking. Everybody loves classical music. They just don't know about it. So I would say that whether it's this extraordinary statement, <laughs> if it's that, Everybody understands that. You don't need special education. You don't need to be taught anything. You don't need to study a book or learn harmony. You just respond. That's the power of this language. Now I want to turn to Mozart. And the reason I choose, choose Mozart, because for us musicians, Mozart is a kind of a god. We have several gods. We have Bach. And Bach, you can't even talk about Bach. But uh, Bach is a, has, a, has a universal language of spirituality everything he wrote was for the glory of god and whether you believe in god or not is completely irrelevant it's that 
uplifted feeling that all human beings strive for. And, and there's Beethoven, Beethoven, a titan, and you have Schubert, and you have Brahms, and you have all these uh, great figures, Wagner, you know, all, all these, uh, Mahler, oh my God, you know, who brought the whole of the world into music. But I want to focus on Mozart, because Mozart was not only maybe the greatest human being who ever lived. I don't know. It's not impossible. Somebody said that to me once, and I thought about it, and I thought, yes, probably. I mean, Leonardo, who, Michelangelo, I don't know who, Shakespeare maybe, but I think it's possible. It's Mozart. And the thing that's so incredible about Mozart is that he, his gift came, it must have come from God. There's no other explanation. Of course, I don't believe in God, but that's neither here nor there. It, Amadeus is his middle name, right? lover of God, and he wrote 640 works from the floor to the ceiling and never had to cross out anything. No, never made a mistake. Beethoven made mistakes continuously, rewriting, recreating, going over, struggling. Mozart, not at all. Divine. Every piece is written perfectly. Somehow it came to him and he wrote it down. There are no crossings out. And he had the most divine disposition. He didn't believe that anything could fail. He just didn't believe in failure. He, did, he, he believed that, that everything that happened in his 600 letters, there's no, virtually no sentence. He would say, describe a concert. He said to his father, he said, we had a fantastic concert. The choir was great and the orchestra, in, unbelievable. And the singers, the best. Oh, incidentally, there was nobody there and we lost money. But it was great and they invited me back to give another. He always moved towards that great spirit. And nothing that happened could deter him from the path. And even when he got older, and of course he didn't get very old, you know, he died at 35, imagine that. That's something to think about, that all these composers, I mean, like Schubert, 34 years old, and they put out this unbelievable amount. Well, Mozart had terrible handicaps. He lost four children to death. He had one terrible financial catastrophe and professional catastrophe after another and apparently his enthusiasm and his optimism rose isn't that amazing so for me mozart is a kind of i have a friend who has a house with one room devoted to mozart only mozart nothing is allowed in there that isn't about mozart that spirit that attitude that optimism i call that amadeity and we could use that right now that spirit of joy and of confidence and support and enthusiasm. And so I wanted to take you into the world of Mozart. Now, the interesting thing about Mozart is that he was the greatest opera composer probably who ever lived. I mean, never mind about what the competition is, he's good enough. He wrote all those great operas like Matthew Flute and Marriage of Figaro and Cosi Fantuti and now Don Giovanni, the greatest of them all. But there is a sense in which, even in the music which he did not write words for, or where there was no story, in a sense, it's operatic. And I wanted to explain that. And I wanted to explore this idea that music can actually transform the way we think and live, and therefore transform our being. That's what I want to explore. So now let's see what is the opera. We know in the Beethoven what the story is. It's about death and about all the emotions that come in death in the funeral march. What about this? <laughs> now that's the first phrase of a sonata movement by Mozart. Kirchel 330. Kirchel is just like opus, except it, Mr. Kirchel was the person who organized Mozart's music and gave it a number. So it starts like this. It could go to hum. That would be beautiful. Instead, he goes, I love you so. It seems as though it has words, doesn't it? I love you so. And then toy. That energy around that little turn makes my body move towards you. No, I love you so. And then 
Now that's a surprise because he could have gone or and he said he won't That's a deceptive cadence because we don't expect it. And an appoggiatura. Appoggiatura is where you lean on a note. It gives a little bit of heart to it. So you can imagine it's a couple maybe. I don't know what the story is, but let's imagine it's a couple. And one says, I love you so. It's just about joy. And it's moved from the tonic to the dominant, but it's not very important. It's normal. But what's exciting is it's been about the mood of joy, of communication, of love. And so it's so beautiful. It's eight bars of music. And then he says, do it again. And we're going to do it again. Because A, he says so, and B, because if you do it again, you get a chance to do it a little differently. And second of all, if you do it again, it gives a feeling of solidity. We have presented the melody in a way that can never be forgotten. So we try it again, but a little differently. And here it comes. Now we go on. Isn't that beautiful? It's as if somebody's talking to you. Imagine somebody said to you, You'd probably say, And then together, nice three times it comes the first person says oh, da, 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 da. I don't know what the words are but you can imagine oh, yeah, da, da, da. Oh, da, da. now together oh, da, da, da. now unfortunately the father of the girl doesn't want them to be together he doesn't think he doesn't approve of the guy and he says bom, 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 I don't know if that's what the story is. I just invented it, but you can imagine. Dom, dom. No, you don't. He said, no, you don't. Always oh, said, dom. those three notes. Always, oh, you remember this one? Dom, dom, dom. I'm full of love. I love you. Love. Oh, no, you don't. That's what he says, right? So something like that. Oh, no, you don't. And she says, but daddy, I love him so much. Oh, so tender. Can you imagine music more tender than that? And it's going to be so much fun. Oh, we're going to have children. No, I just invent that. You understand something joyful. And now he's back in the original key, which he was in the beginning. All right, so that is a terrific amount of energy and different characteristics. So again, isn't that beautiful? Can you imagine somebody singing that? Major, the key of F major. Now comes something different. 
sadness, loss, something goes wrong, and so it goes into the minor. There are those three notes. You remember? The moment I play the da 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 da, my body seems to move this way. I call that one buttock playing. And the eyes and everything feels joyful, and the smile. But it is. Palpitating, palpitating energy. Now a question. What are you? Maybe it's the two of them singing together. One says, and the other one says, and there are accents, and that's obviously that's a, a despair going on there. singing there. And of course we want to hear that again, but let's do it a little different, very soft this time. Exactly the same thing. You remember? But this time it's different. Listen. That we've never had before. Oh, it's like a stab in the heart of despair and sadness and grief. That E natural, that's a special moment. When that comes, that changes everything. So, that's the end of the middle section. But notice something. Everything so far has been in eight bar phrases. Four plus four plus four. This one is only four. It doesn't have the eight bars, it only has four. So something is left unfinished. Now what happens is it goes back. But you, that's the beginning. But it's different. It's different because of all we've experienced, all we've been through. 
so it has a different tone a different feel it's also marked like the first part andante cantabile so it must be full of singing and it's also marked dolce but it's sweetness but it's a different kind of sweetness i think <laughs> doesn't repeat. <laughs> you remember that prayer? <laughs> So it must be the end of the second part. Well, but remember, there were four bars up there that were left hanging unresolved. And so we need to have four more bars. And now come these four bars. And they're so beautiful and so tender. They're marked pianissimo. They start with those three notes. But instead of in tom tom, they're in the home key, F major, settle. And there's a sense in which, I believe, the music seems to say goodbye, farewell. I don't know why you judge for yourself, but it's almost as if the words say adieu, farewell. <laughs> at the end matching the four bars with that E natural which is the darkest saddest moment and this is the happiest the resolution it's as if words are saying it's going to be all right isn't that beautiful so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest that we um, experience the whole piece and what I would like you to do, and I want to say one thing before I start, which is, and I'm not a pianist, and uh, you may have noticed that uh, uh, I make occasional mistakes. I'm sorry, that's not my instrument, and I couldn't have an orchestra here. Unfortunately, we couldn't bring the orchestra here. One day soon, I hope, we'll have orchestra rehearsals and concerts again. And when we do, it's going to be such an unbelievable relief for people. People are going to cry just to see the orchestra on stage. The last concert in Symphony Hall on March the 12th was my youth orchestra playing Petrushka and Symphony Fantastique, and not a sound has been heard in that great revered hall since that day, and may not for a very long time to come. When we come back and make music again, I think people are going to discover a new depth of experience which they took for granted before. That's my belief. A kind of listening that wasn't there before. A kind of involvement in the music like we've been doing now where you feel the emotional content and the contours and the shaping and the dynamics and the direction of the music in a more deep way. The way that we musicians love to think. And if that were an outcome of this catastrophe, of this disaster, that would be a wonderful thing. I hope we just don't go back to business as usual. We have a huge opening now, a pathway for all of us to discover things more deeply. I had a lovely experience, if I may just put this in here. The, um, the last concert we gave with the youth orchestra had the, the Petrushka of Stravinsky. And uh, it's a very difficult, very complicated modern piece, which most people don't know and don't take care of. But there was a 
a mother listening, a, d a teacher listening with her 10 year old girl. And the girl got very, because the words of the story were on the screen, so she could find out what the story was. And she wanted Petrushka to get the girl, the ballerina, and she was rooting for the, the, the Petrushka against the moor. And her mother said, why? And she said, well, I can see, obviously they belong together. <laughs> well, the mother, who was the teacher, said, hmm, I wonder what it is in the music that makes her feel that way. And she was feeling the same way herself. And when I heard that, I said, now I've got a little time on my hand. Actually, a lot of time on my hand. I'm going to describe this. And I took the story of Petrushka and I did a deep analysis for a 10 year old of the story and what happens in the story and how the music tells that story. That never would have happened if it hadn't been for our time. And then she listened to it and she loved it. And she said in her little letter, which she wrote to me, you changed my life, a 10 year old. That is something. We have a huge opportunity now, all of us just connected this way in screens around the world, people in all parts of the world listening, paying attention, and thinking about what is this art? What is this great experience that people talk about? Now, this is a comparatively simple piece. This is not a Mozart opera or even a symphony. It's just a solo piano piece. And yet it can speak to us in a clear language of the heart, a language of love, a language of disappointment and sadness and e-naturals. That E natural, you'll never forget that E natural. How it digs into the heart and makes us feel so sad. And then the resolution when it says farewell. So what I want you to do just before I play this piece through is think about your state of mind now, what, what your body feels like, the breathing, the tension, the mood, the sense of being that you have. And then as you listen, listen for all the details that you can hear. And look, you don't need the story. I invented the story to make it alive. People who love music and who live in music and who play music and conduct music, they don't need the story because the story is built in. When they hear that, boom, 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 they hear love. They hear boom, 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 boom. Look at my body turn towards you in love, one buttock playing, because that's what the, that's what Mozart fills my body with direction. I can't play that. Dum, dum, dum. I could do it if I were working in a bank, but not. You know, what, 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 what. That music does it to us. We don't do it to the music. It does it to us. And through us, we're like vicars. We musicians are like the vicars in the church. Don't clap at the vicar. I mean, it's very nice. You have a good vicar, very good. But it's nothing to do with the vicar. The vicar is just the instrument through which the people in the audience have the experience which the composer was desiring them to feel. And so allow yourself to feel those things. And then notice when you get to the end, and we do that final farewell, notice the state of mind of your body. Notice whether you feel liberated, free, open-hearted, generous, calm, loving, engaged, inclusive. And if you do, you will have entered the world of possibility brought there by Mozart, brought there by the language of music, available to everybody. And if you're 10 years old, you can experience it too. That's the beauty. It doesn't need somebody who's you're old and gray-haired and being around and you know doing it for good cultural reasons. No, this is Mozart speaking to humanity from his heart to your heart. And I want you to notice what it does for you. If I make a mistake, because I'm not a pianist, I want to tell you what we practice in the Boston Philharmonic and the Boston Philharmonic Youth Orchestra. If somebody makes a mistake, we say, how fascinating. And the reason for that is it pushes the hands up and liberates the body because otherwise you go into this, oh my God, I made a mistake. And then you're more likely to make another mistake. So that 
throws it up and then the other thing is it gives you a chance to think about what went wrong and what you can fix the next time and make sure that it happens so if i make a mistake you'll hear me saying internally what uh, how fascinating but the other thing i want to tell you is the last thing and that is why do we do this because we want to reach the soul of people into their soul not into their intellect into their soul and Plato said this 3,000 years ago, music is the language of the soul. Now, the only way we know if we've reached people, and this isn't only true of music, it's true of everybody, is if their eyes are shining. If their eyes are shining, we know we've reached them and spoken to them. And so when this is all over, I can't see you, but you'll have people around you and you might look around the room and see whose eyes are shining. And then we'll know whether we spoke to each other today from so many distant places. Four minutes of music. Let's go on the journey. And thank you for being here.
Thank you for listening. Come back soon. <laughs>